It's hard to imagine God saying, I hate, I despise your worship services, your religious gatherings. These words come from the Old Testament prophet. If they proclaim God's anger or God's disappointment with the Israelite people as they gather to worship, the Lord continues, I'm tired of listening to your hymns. Put away your harps. Close that piano. Unplug that new organ you have. It's all noise to me. Don't even bother to take up an offering. You have so let me down. I will not accept it. This is not the worship that I desire. What's, what's wrong with our worship? Are you surprised that God could be displeased and disappointed, even angry when we gather and pray, we sing, we give money, we listen to sermons? In fact, God says our worship really isn't worship. Though it may seem weird to think, it certainly is a common theme in the scripture. Sometimes what we think and believe is worship is anything but worship in God's eyes. Maybe you've noticed that you hear that theme again and again in the Bible. It's not just an Old Testament observation. We have just heard the words of Jesus when Jesus' frustration, even anger with the Pharisees who parade their piety with trumpets and great fanfare. Some of the Old Testament prophets were written during times of great social upheaval, times of self-indulgence and indifference to the needs of others around them. Any of that sound familiar? What kind of worship does God want from us, even on this 4th of July Sunday? The prophet Amos says, how can you call yourself faithful, you who lie on beds of ivory surrounded with luxury, eating the meat of the tenderest lambs and sing songs to the sound of the harps? You do all that, but you're not grieved or concerned over the plight of others. You know what Amos calls these people? He calls them fat cows. Now that's a bold insult in any time, any culture. They are self-indulgent, trampling the poor, living comfortably in their homes made out of fine stone. When they gather, sure, they do all the right things. They bring offerings of grain and fat calves. And the Lord says, this isn't worship. I hate and I despise your outward show when your actions and your lifestyles contradict the words you're saying. You see, the prophets are trying to warn the children of Israel, both the northern and southern kingdoms, that they're ignoring the cries for help, the cries for mercy from the poor, the orphans, the widows, those who are most vulnerable, those who are dependent on others. The kingdoms are overtaken by the Assyrians and then Babylon. Their leaders are carried away into the foreign land of Babylon. Their temple is destroyed. The people are left almost without any hope. It will be generations before they return. And when they return, their homeland is nothing like they left. It's a different place. Their beautiful temple is in ruins. And the people who have stayed behind are different too. They've been influenced by the people around them. They're worshiping other gods. They're making idols. They're eating the forbidden food. They're ignoring the needs of others and perverting justice. And once again, a prophet emerges to call them back to true worship. Those are the words Pam just read today. And they echo the lament and the anguish of God who desires worship that is more than lip service, more than empty words. Worship that is true action of commitment for others. Have you noticed that pattern we hear in the words of the prophet of the, New, of the Old Testament? There is a sense that we never seem to learn from the past. We hear these words again in our lives. Any of that sound familiar? Why do you even bother to call yourself worshiping and fasting, the Lord asked? You're only serving yourself. Your worship isn't worship at all. Sure, you make all the gestures and even dress like you're repenting with sackcloths and ashes as if you're truly going to change, but you don't. You're only pretending. And maybe you fooled yourself into thinking you're worshiping. But it's only a charade. That's not the sort of worship I want and desire. Today's words from Isaiah spells out very clearly what God wants from us. To remove the yoke 
the burdens, the injustice we've placed on others. To stop pointing our fingers and accusing others and instead offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Worship like that is true worship. Then your light will rise in the darkness. I know we've heard the words from the earlier prophet Micah. We've heard those words and we either forget them or we ignore them because they're just far too challenging to us. When the Lord asks, what does the Lord desire and want from us? It's not those big offerings. It's not the offerings of grain or ram or rivers of oil. It's not even our firstborn or a big check. Again and again, the Lord has said what it is that he desires in worship. And it is to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. That's worship. No wonder Jesus will turn again to the meaning of worship when he challenges those who are the religious leaders, those who are practicing and parading their their piety so others would be impressed. You give, he says, but do not sound a trumpet as you drop in your offering, as the hypocrites do. They just want to be seen by others. When you're praying, don't use a bunch of big words to impress others who overhear you. When you fast, don't look dismal just to show off how religious you are. That's worship. That's not real worship. You're only pretending for the show of it all. And then Jesus challenges us to practice what we say we believe. You see, our worship is not separate from the ways in which we live each day, not just what we do on Sundays. Our worship involves how we treat one another. True worship involves our praise of God, but also our commitment to action on behalf of God, in our broken world, to bring compassion and to bring justice. Now it's the 4th of July, and I'm always in a bind on this holiday, especially when it falls right on a Sunday. I'm grateful to be American. I love this country, even with all our struggles and faults. But today's worship needs to be more than a patriotic celebration. I'm not sure God would be pleased with that, because God not only blesses America... God blesses every country and calls and challenges us to live faithfully together on this one planet we call Earth. As God's stewards, we are accountable to how we treat the water, the air, the minerals, how we treat one another. Whether we're Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim or none of the above, that's part of our worship. and We're challenged to care for one another, especially for those in need. The prophet Isaiah has just asked a question about our worship. What is the fast that God chooses? What is the best way to worship? I think God must weep at times of the ways in which our Christian family have divided ourselves based on outward expressions. Whether we genuflect when we walk into a sanctuary, whether we cover our heads when we pray, whether we kneel or stand, should we baptize with a handful of water or should we go down to the river and totally immerse someone? And who could come to this table? Who has the authority to say who's invited? Is grape juice okay or do we need wine? The best way to worship and what God wants from us is not the right posture, not the right rituals. Instead, it is our attitude and our commitment to loose the chains of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, to share your bread with the hungry, to bring homeless poor into your house, to cover the naked and the vulnerable. I'm intrigued by places of worship that have literally turned their sanctuary into food distribution centers. They turn their Sunday school classrooms into dental clinics and health clinics. Their fellowship hall into shelters where unhoused people can sleep at night. What is better worship? Is it singing hymns and offering prayers and putting money in the collection box? Or is it handing out blankets? Is it setting up cots? Is it either? Is it or? Of course not. It's both, but we cannot separate worship into a Sunday morning ritual. I'm proud to be part of this church family that takes seriously worship and with great delight whenever we gather to sing and pray and listen. But we're also committed in our worship to helping provide the necessities of life for those around us. So whether we're in the sanctuary today or watching live stream worship service with all of us, 
whether you're writing a check for others in need, true worship involves a total commitment to serve God by our actions, by our prayers, and by our offerings on behalf of others and our involvement in compassion. Today, we might pledge and promise our allegiance to the American flag, to this country, and we give thanks for the rights and privileges we enjoy, and to many over the centuries who have made this possible. Those acts of devotion and commitment are all important. They're well, they're good. But that alone is not worship of God. Instead, God asks all people to pledge and proclaim and to work toward justice, toward fairness, and equal treatment of all, and liberty for everyone. Freedom from rules and laws and attitudes and actions that limit and alienate those who are kin to us. That's part of true worship. The Bible says do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly, aware that we may not always have all the right answers and perspectives and insights, yet with humility, we are trying to walk humbly and listen to God. So this day we gather around this Lord's table. We come to worship before God's presence, aware that we may have injured or fractured relationships in our lives. And before we come to this table, before we offer our gifts to God, our worship must also include our interactions with those around us. Our worship must include our relationships with others, how we treat each other, how we care for those in need, how we leave our beds of ivory in our homes with our comfort deluxe sleep number settings and listen to the needs and cries of others, some without beds at all. I'm ready to worship, but first I need to confess and offer myself in humility. Did you miss our prayer of confession this morning? Usually we, we tuck it in after that first hymn. What's coming up next? Giving us a chance as we are reminded to reflect on our relationship with others and with God before we come to this table of grace. In that same passage from Matthew, Jesus says if you're offering a gift in worship and you remember there's something broken in your life, a relationship, an estrangement, something that's not quite right, Jesus says first go and reconcile with that other. And then come back and offer your gift. Worship isn't worship. Until we come with honesty and commitment to meet our living God and to care for each other. So now, in words and in song, let us continue our worship of God. <laughs> 